Good morning. Great to be with you in worship this morning as we travel and journey through this season of Lent and we look at the parables of Jesus. Uh, we have a guest preacher with us today, uh, a St. Paul member, St. Paul elder, uh, local Concordia University professor and guest pastor. Uh, we have uh, Ted Hopkins as our preacher leading us to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan this morning. I pray that you are blessed as we hear from God's word and see Jesus. Let's begin with our first hymn this morning, Let Us Ever Walk with Jesus. Please stand. In this holy season, the Son of God humbles himself so that we receive mercy. In this holy season, the Son of God demonstrates that he is the most perfect neighbor to us by serving us with his very life. In this holy season, the Son of God enters into his passion and death so that we are exalted. Oh Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me.
Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, when we were beaten and left for dead by our enemy, the devil, you rescued us through the mercy of your only Son. Enable us to be a compassionate neighbor to others by showing love, mercy, and forgiveness in the same way we have been shown love, mercy, and forgiveness from you. Amen. Please be seated as we hear from God's word. The Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, beginning at verse 13. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. O Lord, have mercy on us. And our epistle reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 13, beginning at verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. O Lord, have mercy on us.
Please stand as we hear the words of Jesus in our gospel reading this morning from Luke chapter 10. We join together in speaking this responsively. Behold, a lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test. He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So, likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated as we sing. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends in Christ, who is your favorite superhero and why? So I know we don't usually do this in church, but I am a teacher, so you're going to have to humor me. If you would, take 30 seconds and share with the person next to you. All right, so 30 seconds. Who's your favorite superhero and why? Go for it. So for me, at least, kind of when I was younger, I really liked Batman. I think it was that, that raw edge and kind of emotional, um, at least, I don't know, emotional resonance it really had with me as a, as a younger man. But when I became a dad, kind of my perspective on these things changed entirely. For one, I, I started to appreciate much more like the, the more Superman sense of justice, truth, goodness, these kind of things began to resonate more with me. But there was something even more than this. Um, well, it was that my kids started wearing costumes, right? So they started putting on the superhero costumes. And my favorite superhero today is Spider-Man because 
my son Thomas, when he was about six, he got a Spider-Man costume for Halloween, and he started wearing that thing like every single day. And it was one of those that had like those fake pads, you know, on the or fake muscles, like pads on the biceps and the chest. So he's running around as like the six-year-old looking like he's like super buff and he's got the mask on. And he would put these cereal box water shooters on his wrists. And so he's like pretending to shoot them at all like the evil villains and the, uh, the bank thieves and all these things as he's running around the house. So whenever I think of, of Spider-Man, I just think of my children, right? Him and then later his little sister who used to do the same thing, though not quite as often. Um, and so it's really, I suppose, my favorite um, superhero might be my children as I reflect on that. But <laughs> kind of, regardless, I, I like Spider-Man. So I, I start with, um, with superheroes today because I think that's the perspective that we usually bring to this parable. So we read the Good Samaritan, we start thinking of hero, not a comic book superhero, of course, more like an everyday hero. Right? That this Good Samaritan is one who's coming to help another. He stoops down to, to serve and to, to save the one in need. And so the parable then, that's fundamentally the story, right? You've got the hero coming in to go and help. And the moral of it then comes out quite simply. The more of it is quite obvious. We are to be the Good Samaritan. So we put ourselves in the place of the Good Samaritan, in, like when we see um, an image like this one, this picture from Paul Omen. And so we need to be the one to stoop down to serve and to save. And we need to avoid then being like the priest and the Levite. That's another part of the moral of this parable as we usually read it. Right? We want to be careful not to simply walk past those in need, but rather take the time out to go and serve. Have compassion. Right? Help. Now, I think there's, there's truth to this understanding of the parable. Don't get me wrong. Jesus absolutely calls you and me into a life of service. We are to care and serve our neighbors. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see those in need and to have compassion. Absolutely true. Nevertheless, I think this reading of the Good Samaritan story as a hero, it misses an important part of understanding this parable within the context of Jesus' own ministry, the people to whom he is ministering, and in fact, I think it even, I think, misses really the, one of the major points of the Christian life of service. I'm afraid that when we read the, the Good Samaritan story as a hero here, what happens is that we miss the radical side of the parable. And it often leaves us, I think, um, at least it leaves our arrogance and also our fear in place. Now, now, the hint, I think, that we've been missing something in this parable is the fact that it's not the good Samaritan who's in the ditch on the side of the road. Or it's not the Samaritan, sorry, I shouldn't say good there. If the Samaritan was in the ditch on the side of the road, this reading would make a lot of sense. Because you see, a hero always comes from a position of authority or a position of power. Right? The hero has some kind of innate ability, some kind of special gift. And it might be hidden, it might not be obvious to everyone, they might have to overcome some adversity, but nonetheless they have some kind of ability um, that they use and some kind of special authority to give to another in need. So whether that's like in the comic books, right, whether that's the super wealthy weapons developer, right, like Batman, or a person with super strength like Superman, or one who's gotten bitten by a radioactive spider. Kind of regardless of the gift here, the hero is the one who comes from a place of power, stoops down to help and to save and to serve. Think about the listeners to Jesus' parable. Would they have thought that at all about a Samaritan? Would they have considered a Samaritan at all to be one who could have considered, who could be considered as one with that kind of ability? I think the, the answer here is obviously no, right? They had no special gifts or ability. In fact, they were hated, even despised by Jewish people. Right? They were outsiders at best, and often they were considered simply, well, evil. They worshipped in the wrong place, right? not Jerusalem, not the temple. They had the wrong holy books. They had a different version. It's called the Samaritan Pentateuch, a different version of the Torah, and they didn't have the prophets at all. And they had claimed to be God's people. Here, for Jewish people, these people, Samaritans, were not hero material. Right? They needed saving. They were not the saviors. So then you come to the priests and the Levites. Now you're some people who could be hero material. These are people who come from a place of authority. They've got something to give. Priests and Levites, they're helping people in their relationship with God. So all the listeners of Jesus' parable here 
would have assumed that a priest and a Levite, they would have something to give to another. He would have expected these, perhaps, to be the saviors. But then, of course, in the parable, Jesus turns our expectations upside down. The priest and the Levite, they're too busy serving God. They couldn't risk becoming unclean for a one single man here. And so they walk right by the Jewish man half dead in the ditch. Now, I'm sure they prayed for him. They probably shook their heads sadly as they went past, wishing things could be different. If it were today, I'm sure they would have posted something on social media, some kind of angry screed against violence or something like that, maybe with the tag, thoughts and prayers going out for this man. What they didn't do was stop and help the dying man. So it wasn't then the heroes, or at least the potential heroes, but it was the victim, the lowly Samaritan who stopped and who helped this Judean man. I, I don't think we can really grasp just how jarring this would have been for those original hearers of this parable. I mean, I'm going to try to do my best here, but I, this parable of a parable doesn't, doesn't quite work as well as it should, but try this on. Okay, let, let's say you went to Florida, and uh, you went to go help victims of a hurricane there. So you, you went down there, and you were building houses for them, and you were helping, and while you were there, the bank foreclosed on your house. And so while you, one day, then, you, you go to like keep building this house for these victims in need, and what you find there on the, on the site, the building site, is a house they built for you, not one you built for them. It sort of works, but the problem there is it's only financial, right? And this is much more than this, not just a matter of finances, but it was cultural, it was, it was social. So even that like falls short of just how jarring this would have been for those people. Like Samaritans simply were, they were the ones in need. They needed the help. They were despised. They were rejected. They were the ones cut off from the land of living God. So the short of it then is that the Samaritans were not the helping heroes. They were the vulnerable victims. And yet, in this parable, it's not the Samaritan who's laying here in the man's arms, limp, arms limp, head hanging, eyes rolled in the back of his head. It's not the Samaritan, it's the Jewish man there like that. The Samaritan instead is the one coming to save. If you think again about the the original the original heroes of the parable here, they would have never put themselves in the shoes of the Samaritan. They just couldn't. What if that means that you and I really aren't supposed to either? Instead, What if we need to to think of ourselves not in terms of the good Samaritan, but rather in terms of the the man who's half dead? And if we think about it, this really fits with the whole scriptures, right? If we're the one who's half dead, um, this this explains kind of what Paul is saying in, for instance, like Ephesians chapter 2, where he calls us dead in our trespasses and our sins. This is what sin has done to us. We can't do anything to save ourselves. Our sins have bloodied us, they have beaten us, and we are the ones who have lost in this drainage ditch that we have created for ourselves. We are, and I think we also feel this, right? We feel the experience of this sin that has put us right here. We're bloodied by our angry, violent outbursts. We're terrified by threats to our control and our power. And we're pushed to the brink by our anxieties. Anxieties about our children, about our health, about so much more. That's what sin has done to us. Without Jesus Christ, this is who we are. Alienated from God, doomed to die. When we say that stupid thing, when guilt erupts inside, this is what we feel. Torn apart from our loved ones, torn apart from God we need really a good Samaritan. When a friend or even a spouse betrays us, we feel isolated and alone like nobody cares. We need a good Samaritan. When death strikes near and the terror of the grave begins to haunt us, and frankly, we're often too ashamed to tell anyone else about our feelings here, we need a good Samaritan. We often, I think, want to be the hero, the hero of our own story, the hero of our own lives. That's what we want. But friends, that's not who we are. We are broken, 
We are lifeless. We are limp and bleeding out in a ditch on the side of the road and unable to help ourselves in relationship to God. That's what sin has done to us. We need a savior, one who will have compassion on us, one who will help us. You see, if this is who we are, and if we are the, the dead man, the half-dead man in the ditch, well, then who's the good Samaritan? I think there's really only one option. Right? Well, it's Jesus. He is our good Samaritan. In fact, he was accused of being a Samaritan by the, the religious authorities themselves. I think it's John, if I remember correctly, it's John chapter 6. I keep needing to actually look that up, and I don't. But I think it's John chapter 6 where they accuse him of having a demon and being a Samaritan. It's he who is this outsider to political authority, an outsider also to religious authority, not a scribe, not a Pharisee, not someone in control at all. And yet, it's he who has come to save us. It's Jesus who in the incarnation comes into our world, who becomes incarnate, our eternal God, becomes incarnate in our flesh to take on our life and walk in our shoes. It's he who who found us bleeding and dying here in our sins and who tends to us, who washes our wounds in the waters of holy baptism, who binds up our gashes with his own robe of righteousness, who feeds us with his own food in the Holy Supper, and who brings us into his church, into, if you will, the inn. And he pays for it all by his own blood, at that deep cost to him, but no cost to you and me. And he does this. He has compassion on us all so that you and I could have forgiveness, life, and salvation in the presence of God. So then, if Jesus isn't calling us to be heroes, like the Good Samaritan, so what does that parable mean then for us? I think there are three things. First, Jesus calls us to stop trying to be spiritual heroes and simply to receive what he gives. That's easier said than done. I mean, I I think we often are so interested in control, controlling our own lives, controlling our own fates, controlling our own everything. And Jesus in the parable says, stop it. Let me actually be in control. Receive my authority hear my word, receive my forgiveness. So then the call then for us is simply to trust, to receive Jesus, to know him as our savior, and to stop trying to take control of our own lives. And the good news here is that precisely when we see ourselves as that half-dead, lifeless one, our good Samaritan is already right there, stooping down to come and save us. The second call of the parable, it reminds us that we are not better than anybody else but nor are we worse. And one problem with the hero understanding of the parable is it begins to separate. You've got your heroes on the one end, you've got your victims on the other, and we begin to just bifurcate everybody into these two categories, the helpers and the ones in need of help. But Jesus won't let us do that. Instead, all of us are in need, and all of us also are called to serve and to help. Everyone here has someone in their lives that they can serve. Even as I, as I was thinking about this, even our homebound members do a deep and great service for us as they lift us up in our prayers. That's why we have things like the prayer chain and why we um, post those in need of prayer. So that also our homebound members may pray for us and offer us this deep and important service. And then think too about all the times when you thought you were the one coming in to help and how often you had your expectations turned around on you. And that person actually helped you way more than than you helped them. Maybe it's just me, but that's happened very often. I I thought I was doing this great thing, and then afterwards reflecting on it, I know how much I got helped by this person that I ostensibly was supposed to be helping. That too, friends, is from the Spirit of God. As the Spirit leads us to be in this community where we're mutually serving one another, not better or worse, simply have different callings, different vocations, in service to one another. Thus, there's no room for arrogance, no room for pride here. For the least of us, right, the least of these, Jesus says, is the greatest in the kingdom of God. And the third, I think we need to stop thinking about Christian service as, like, big and heroic. That's simply not the everyday life of the Christian. 
Once in a while, we might have those moments where we're called to some kind of heroic task. That happens occasionally. But I think many of us, that's not normal, for one. And many of us might go our entire lives without actually having that sort of thing. The Christian life of service is this simple and mundane thing. It, it looks like noticing when a friend is hurting and offering a listening ear. It looks like saying an encouraging word and praying for a neighbor. It looks like putting your family at the top of your list of priorities rather than work or play. The Christian life of vocation just doesn't look like being a hero most of the time. It just looks like following God's word and serving those around us. That's okay. In fact, that's good. I think there's a great freedom here. When we begin to think of how much like, great heroic things we need to do, we can get so fearful that we do nothing at all, and we think that like, we don't measure up. But friends, it, we just need to serve those around us. That's it. Serve our neighbors, our co-workers, our family, our friends. While we're pointing people to the actual hero, to our Lord Jesus Christ, our good Samaritan who has compassion on us and on the world and has come to save. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you stoop down to save us. In your mercy, you wouldn't leave us limp and lifeless under the power of sin and death and evil. But you gave yourself to the cross even for us that we might live. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and for your salvation. Open our eyes that we might see others around us in need and to serve them in your name. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we sing a response to God's word. worship now with our offerings. You may be seated and gather those that God would use them in service to others in their need. I also ask you to take the black folders that are on the center aisle here. Uh, let us know that uh, you're here today or any info that help us be in contact with you, connect you to uh, the word and work of God through St. Paul. Please stand as we sing.
Lord be with you. God invites us to approach his heavenly throne with all our needs. We come without fear at his invitation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. God, who is the perfect neighbor, forgive us for the times we fail to help those in need, whether in body, soul, or spirit. Make us ever better neighbors to our family, friends, and co-workers that they would see Jesus in and through us. Perfect neighbor to those in need. God, who is the perfect neighbor, work through all the leaders of this world that they would show caring to those they serve and those they lead. Transform rulers into neighbors that they would provide for all in need and keep our world a place of peace. Perfect neighbor to those in need. God, who is the perfect neighbor, make your church the place where people grow in their ability to be neighbors not only to one another, but also to those who have not yet come to faith or have fallen away. Use your church to serve the least of these. Perfect neighbor to those in need. God, who is the perfect neighbor, as the good Samaritan saw to it that a helpless victim was brought health and healing, use your healing in mercy to help to heal those among us who are ill, weak, or in need of strength. We ask that you would bring healing to many we know with cancer. Nola, Greg, and Joanne. Peggy, Harry, Leo, and Bethany. Eric, and Virginia, Ken, Shireen, Deanna, and Janice. Lord, we ask that you would bring recovery and healing to Bill and Kathy, Donnie, Joe, and Mark, Steve, Ron, Bill, and Kathy. And Lord, as she enters into hospice care, please continue to watch over Kay Hob, reminding her of your mercy, and draw her close to yourself. Perfect neighbor to those in need. God, who is the perfect neighbor, we remember before you all who have gone before us in the faith, who in their earthly lives demonstrated love to their neighbors and helped and served those in need. Help us to follow after their pattern and example until the day when we meet you, our perfect neighbor, face to face in your new and holy kingdom. Perfect neighbor to those in need. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin nor run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Jesus asked, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. You 
have received the mercy of God, who is Christ, who gave his own life to save you, receive now his blessing. The God who made, who has made himself the perfect neighbor by entering into this world to be our Savior, grant you grace, peace, and strength in your service to others. Amen. Please be seated for a moment of announcements. As we continue into our season of Lent, uh, you're invited to gather uh, around God's Word for a few more uh, midweek services that are coming up. We have one this Wednesday, the 15th, and then the 22nd. And then uh, we will not have um, a, uh, a midweek service the week before Holy Week. And then our Holy Week schedule is in the back um, inside cover of your worship folder. You can find it there with uh, information times, uh, when all that will be. So um, if you uh, didn't grab one of those postcards, I think we still have some at uh, each entrance to uh, remember those times, or you can you know, rip this out and put it on your fridge, whichever is helpful for you to know those service times coming up. Uh, we are going to be decorating our space with uh, Easter lilies, so if you uh, would like to um, be part of that uh, beautification of this space or up at the school site, Please uh, fill one of these out in honor of or memory of someone else. Uh, we can also make sure that, uh, one of those gets delivered to one of our homebound members, if you wish, or you can take that with you after those Easter services. Uh, thank you um, for, for doing that. You can drop this um, over by the office window or hand it to um, one of the elders on your way out, uh, etc. Uh, thank you for um, taking time to fill this out. I think we'll have these in the worship folders one more week next week. Uh, let's see, our pathway class begins tonight, so for those of you who are interested in learning more about St. Paul's, our church and school ministry, uh, the um, pathway class will meet up at the school starting at 5 o'clock to 6.30, there is uh, child care available, we'll be gathering to uh, learn more about um, the, uh, the, this church that God has placed here, but also the faith that we get to proclaim here. So if you want to know more about that, uh, I'll be over at this door after the service, so you can uh, ask me about it there, and uh, look forward to being with uh, some of you that I know are signed up for that this evening. Uh, listening Post is uh, going to be next week, so we're going to be here in this space uh, next week after church, then there'll be a, uh, a video um, presentation, uh, like for five minutes, and so if... Uh, if you can only stay after church for just a couple minutes next week, please stay at least for that. And then we'll have some time of question and answer of uh, some of the things that have been going on in the Mission Task Force and some findings and give you an opportunity to learn more about things going on there. So please uh, stay, uh, plan to stay after church just for a few minutes next week for that listening post. That'll be after each service next, uh, next week. And then um, finally... I would like to welcome up Liz for our auction announcement. We have a school auction coming up, and so she's going to tell us a bit more about it, and Alex is going to uh, actually give the announcement, I think. Is that, is that right? Are you going to do it? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Liz Barr, and I'm one of the presidents of the PTL, and it's auction time, so we are planning our spring auction which is one of our biggest fundraisers at the school. Um, last year, we had our auction for the first time, I think in a couple years, in person at the garage in Belleville, and we raised about $80,000 for our classroom enhancements. This year, we are raising money for playground enhancements, because as you know, there's going to be some construction going on up at the school. So our theme this year is God at Work, and it is April 15th over at the garage in Belleville. If you have an item you'd like to donate, if you are a business and you'd like to advertise your business in our program, if you'd like to be an event sponsor, there's a QR code on the back of the program. The paperwork is at the back on the table. And we would love to see you. There's tickets available. It's going to be a great night. We have lots of great items. You can win a year of tuition. We're having a door prize drawing for that. We have, I believe, a trip to Traverse City. We have Michigan Ohio State football tickets up for auction. So it's going to be a great time, and we hope you can donate an item, uh, may, uh, be a sponsor for the event, 
get some tickets and come and have a good time with us and raise money for our kids and a new playground. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I am looking forward to it. And uh, you can also bid on the famed uh, Pastor Rago and my wife Mandy. We, um, we put together a fondue dinner, uh, four-course fondue dinner with wine pairing. Uh, so if that is of interest to you, uh, you got to be at the auction to bid on it. Um, so uh, looking forward to offering that up. And you get to hang out with us for an evening of food. And it's delicious. So uh, that's just my shameless plug for, the, for that item. Uh, we, um, we've had an opportunity to uh, hear uh, the word of God and uh, kind of be reshaped in some of our calibration. We like to be the hero of the story or at least place ourselves under the burden of having to be the hero of the story. We know that that is Christ, the one who has come for us. And so we rejoice in all that he does to lift us up and bear us and bring us to life. Let's stand and sing in his name as we go this morning.